Hello, hello. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to another Symbolic Studies live stream. I am your host, Mario, in case you're new to the channel. Um, it is Tuesday, the day of Mars, and so it's very appropriate that, uh, that I would be giving this presentation today. And, um, you know, I've been looking into Mars symbolism for a while now, but Aries really pulled me in into uh, the astrological side of things. So I did a presentation on the Emperor card, and I've been talking about Aries symbolism on various live streams. And I just felt called to talk about the red planet, the planet of war, Mars. And so um, this will be a fun time. I have a lot of slides to get through. I'm kind of trying a different format this time. Um, really, really stoked about that. But uh, yeah, let's just get into it because there is a lot of ground to cover. And if you're here live, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And if you check it uh, this out after the fact, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that as well. So before we get into things, just want to say that uh, if you want to support the channel, there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, as an example, it's really simple, really basic, but liking, sharing, and subscribing does go a long way in helping uh, the algorithm here. So uh, by all means, please take advantage uh, of those things to help um, boost the channel and people's awareness of it. I would greatly appreciate it. And also, if you're interested, you can become a patron on Patreon. So patreon.com slash symbolic studies. That is where I'm at. And um, honestly, thank you so much to all my patrons. It's really cool to have um, a little crew over there supporting me. It means a lot, and it actually goes a long, long way. So patreon.com slash symbolic studies. But with that out of the way, let's talk about Mars and Mars symbolism. So I said the format today would be a little different, and it is in certain ways. But um, yeah, the, the main thing behind that is that I really want to break down the word Mars. I think that that's appropriate for a few different reasons. And I also want to break down the glyph of Mars and what that represents. So instead of getting really, um, you know, instead of getting in the weeds with all sorts of different things related to Mars, I really wanted to kind of get down to the basics and talk about the actual word itself. Why has this planet been named Mars? What's encoded in that name? Uh, what other words are associated with Mars? And uh, I'll be doing the same thing with the glyph as well. And in between those sections, I have other stuff that I want to talk about. But um, I feel like kind of the heart of this presentation is really, really unpacking um, the name and then also the glyph, right? But there it is. So Mars, M-A-R-S. And uh, there's a lot of words that um, start with M-A-R. And uh, a lot of them, most of them, I would say, relate to the red planet in some way, shape, or form. And so, um, you know, I hang out with people online and they're really, really excellent at breaking down words. They're interested in uh, gematria. Their uh, etymological understanding of things is sort of next level. And I like to get down um, in my own way with wordplay and things like that. And with this word in particular, I feel like I have a... Um, you know, a resonance with Mars, because my name is Mario, which I'll be getting into, which literally comes from Mars. So for whatever reason, I felt like this was just something that we needed to dive into. So Mars, M-A-R-S, right? Well, it's really interesting because a simple switch of some letters gives us rams. So there's an anagram within Mars that is related to the red planet. And, um, you know, it just goes without saying that the ram, the sign of the ram is Aries, which is ruled by Mars, right? So just within that sort of uh, way of doing things, the anagram wordplay um, angle, you have rams. And I didn't include it here, but you could also create arms as well, 
which I think is interesting because it reminds me of like armor, you know, or to bear arms. And so a lot of what uh, Mars has to do with has to do with independence. It has to do with um, conflict. There's a lot of beautiful things with all of the planets, but there's also shadow elements with all of the planets as well, right? So independence, um, you know, for yourself, that's a fantastic thing. Um, when you get a few people who are very independent and very stubborn, that could lead to conflict, that can lead to aggression. Um, and rams, uh, you know, they're uh, an aggressive animal, to say the least. And they have those big, powerful horns, and they butt heads for dominance and supremacy. And so this is how they determine their hierarchy, and this is how they determine, you know, who has the right to mate, essentially. And so arms, you can uh, look at that from a military sort of context, right? Again, bearing arms. Um, I also think it's kind of interesting, too, that um, Gemini is oftentimes related to the arms. And with Gemini symbolism, there is um, kind of that conflict or that divisiveness that comes into play. Because generally, right, the mythology with Gemini and the hero twins is that there is a light twin, there's a dark twin, or a good twin and an evil twin. And at some point, generally, their storyline comes to a head. And um, generally, the darker twin kills the light twin. And so um, when it comes to arms as well, our arms are our weapons. Our fists are weapons. And so there's a lot of arm symbolism that actually has to do with war and conflict. We call it the army, right? And so anyway, so you have all these interesting words just within Mars, rams, arms, etc. So I felt like that was worth pointing out. But Mars was the influence for March, which is what soldiers do, right? And also, this is the month in which Mars season, the, um, the Martian New Year, you could call it, begins. This is when Aries begins, is in March. That's not a coincidence that these things are related to each other. Um, there's also the whole idea of beware the Ides of March as well. This is uh, the time of year, Aries season is the time of year when um, multiple things get sacrificed. Symbolically, you know, uh, with the various holy days that occur during this time of year. And so there is a sacrificial component to this time of year, to spring. And to me, it's actually, it makes so much sense that this would be the case. And it's actually a really beautiful thing. And the way I tend to look at that is that in order for the astrological year to begin, in order for the Martian New Year to begin, something needs to be sacrificed in order for that cycle to be, to be propelled forward, I would say. So in order for a bonfire to really take off, you know, we need that wood to, um, to catch fire. So in order to have a flame, something needs to burn. Right. And so um, this fits really nicely with a lot of the energy that we'll be talking about today because Mars is obviously a fire planet. So um, so March comes from Mars. And um, like I said, this is a time of sacrifice. So there have been a lot of wars have occurred during this time of year were initiated or started during this time of year. And um, like I said, I believe I already mentioned uh, Caesar, uh, maybe I did not say that, but Caesar was assassinated during this time of year as well. Beware the Ides of March. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified during this time of year as well. Um, the sacrificial lamb narrative occurs during this time of year as well, and Christ is that sacrificial lamb. And I would say, too, by extension, um, you know, emperors and kings um, have played that role of being that sacrificial lamb. And it's really interesting. Uh, my girlfriend, Michelle, was just reading about this in one of her books. But the whole idea of um, sacrificing the king if they're not pulling their own weight. And it's my understanding that it wasn't uncommon 
for um, the killing of the king ritual to occur during this time of year as well, which all of this fits really nicely with uh, the card that corresponds with Aries season, because the card that corresponds with Aries season is the emperor card. It's the fourth card of the major arcana. And so we'll be getting into that card a little bit as well. But um, if you haven't seen it, I did a whole breakdown and I went through all of my cards, all of my emperor cards in my decks. It's like 23 or 24 cards or something like that. And I went from uh, the newest cards in my collection to the oldest cards in my collection, spanning from, you know, cards that were released within the last or decks that were released within the last few years, um, all the way back to the 15th century, which I have a few cards um, from that era. And so there were a lot of very, very interesting bits of information uh, that I picked up from uh, that presentation, but just going back in chronological order, descending chronological order, a lot of interesting details come to light. And uh, there's a few of those things that I'll be mentioning uh, throughout this presentation today. Also, I just have to say the idea of marching as well, like a marching band, right? Or again, soldiers march from location to location. The idea of movement is so integrated with Mars. Even just look at the glyph of Mars and you have that arrow and that arrow implies movement. And so um, Mars is very fiery. There's a lot of um, energy associated with that planet. Also with uh, Aries and uh, the Ram right and so to march is to move forward and that's what the ram does the ram uh moves forward that's how uh he fights right is just by going forward really quickly that's how they butt heads obviously and the ram is also known for ascending upwards too so the ram lives at higher elevations and so there's an ascension quality to the ram and to me, this a lot of it relates back to um, you know sexual symbolism, which I get into in a lot of my presentations because I really feel like it's the heart um, of a lot of the things that I'm decoding. Um, you know, arguably, you know, for a while I've heard, like my whole life probably, that uh, our sperm cells are little soldiers, <laughs> right? And uh, it's a very competitive thing what happens with ejaculation, and if you're trying to inseminate a woman and conceive a child. Um, and so your sperm cells are your soldiers. They go out to battle. It's extremely competitive, as is Mars, the red planet. That's kind of what it brings out. Um, that's partly what I'm talking about with the ram symbolism and everything else. And there's only going to be one sperm cell that's actually going to um, penetrate that egg and, um, and inseminate it. And so to me, the parallel between marching soldiers and then sexual symbolism, I think it's very, very appropriate. Um, you know, with traditional gender symbolism, it's the man that goes out and conquests, or it's the man that goes out and brings home the bacon. And the woman stays home, takes care of the children. She's domestic. That's her role. And um, that's just kind of how things have been done for a really, really long time. And obviously, uh, in the modern world, there's lots of exceptions to this rule, but again, under traditional gender symbolism, um, that's what you're going to see, is that the men generally are more viewed as being um, travelers, and so there's a mercurial sort of thing going on there, actually, Mercury being the messenger of the gods and being a traveler, um, and so I just thought I would point that out as well. So there's going to be a lot of things that overlap uh, in this presentation. And I think by the end of it, you'll see, um, obviously, a lot of these connections. But there you have it. March literally coming uh, from Mars. The word mark as well comes from Mars, right? So to mark something, right, might be to, um, to scratch it or to make a dent on it, you know, um, a lot of marks are created during violence and uh, acts of aggression during war, right? Also to be marked is to be targeted as well. When you target something, that means you're going to go after something. That means that something is going to be probably projected your way, <laughs> whether it's a bullet or an arrow or a spear or a, a sword 
what have you. So being marked means being targeted. And so you can clearly see, you know, a marksman, right? You can clearly see how the word mark has um, overlapping symbolism literally with uh, the planet of war, the red planet, Mars. And a lot of this stuff too, obviously, it just goes without saying. Unless you like sit down and think about it, or unless you're kind of in this uh, sort of mindset, it could very easily just not get noticed a lot of these things. But I had a really good time just writing down all of these words that kind of came to mind that starts with M-A-R and, uh, you know, just decoding and seeing how it relates, you know, to, uh, to Mars, the planet Mars. So Mark, that's kind of an obvious one, I would think. You know, a word that um, I didn't think was as obvious, but I have a newfound sort of appreciation for it, is the fact that martyr also comes from Mars. And so a martyr is someone who is killed, you know, for their cause or for their religion, you know, um, for whatever it is they're standing up for or believe in, right? That makes perfect sense with airy season. And that makes perfect sense with... Um, a lot of the things I've been saying about sacrifice and Mars, right? So there you have M-A-R at the beginning of martyr. You know, Christ was a martyr. Um, there's many examples of, uh, of martyrs throughout history and in mythology. And I was interested to see, actually, I don't have the list here, but in one of my resources, um, the deities that also start with M-A-R that relate to Mars is very, very fascinating and very interesting. And there's way more than I realized. Um, there's a couple that I'll be talking about here today, but um, there's many more that could be explored and unpacked, right? But the concept of martyrdom is absolutely a Martian concept, absolutely relates to this time of year. And I just have to say too, at the end of martyr, you have tier, T-Y-R. We'll be getting into that here in a bit. But um, this deity, this Norse god, is very much related to Mars as well, as we'll see uh, later on in the presentation. <laughs> and so now we have Mario, right? And so I remember seeing the entry or the meaning of Mario like when I was a kid. And what I remember reading was that Mario meant mighty warrior. And so the warrior aspect is obviously very appropriate for MAR, for Mars, right? War is a concept, right? It's, it's called uh, the planet of war. Even if you flip the W, you get Mar, right? So Mars flipping the M to create a W, you get wars. And so this doesn't work with all letters, but there are some letters where you can literally invert the letter and uh, it creates a new word. And surprisingly, there are a number of words where the letter flip um, actually is completely related to the other word. So as an example, um, mind and wind. You flip the M, you get wind. Um, and so there's a lot of overlapping themes with wind symbolism, air symbolism, and the mind, right? So Mario... It means mighty warrior or perhaps just warrior, but it is absolutely related to Mars. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see that in the 15th century Solobuska deck, they don't have a emperor card. So the fourth card of the Major Arcana, once again, is the emperor. It corresponds with Ares. It corresponds with Mars. They don't have an emperor card per se, but they have a Mario card which I was really stoked to see. Um, and this is the correspondence in the Solobuska deck for the emperor. So on the right-hand side, you can see it. You can see Roman numeral four. And um, it's because this is symbolically, this is the card that corresponds with Aries. It's the card that corresponds with Mars. And I broke this down in my other presentation about the emperor card. This was the card that I brought forth to represent the emperor. Um, in that presentation for the Solobuska. And there's lots of fascinating things to get into with this card. This whole entire deck, by the way, is so multifaceted and multi-layered. There are subliminal things going on in that deck that would blow your mind, 
And also, I would say that there are still secrets to be uncovered. Um, it's such a mysterious, fascinating deck that I've long considered maybe just doing a whole presentation where we get into some of my favorite cards or even some of the more mysterious cards. Um, but suffice it to say, this is the card that corresponds with Mars. He has a shield that's a, a tool of war. Obviously, he has that flag uh, behind him. You'll see that the sacrificial lamb, the Lamb of God, oftentimes is holding that flag. Um, you'll see that in another Emperor card that I have later on in the presentation. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but he's wearing red. He's also wearing a helmet, right? And then also you can see um, what looks like the handle of a sword coming out from his crotch area. So this is a very deliberate reference uh, to the phallus, to his penis. So it looks like an erect penis, right? And even the tip of the blade, it kind of, or excuse me, the tip of the handle there, it almost looks like ram horns, does it not? And so I think, it, therefore too, it also looks like the glyph for Ares. And so I think that that's deliberate. There's a lot of interesting things going on in this deck that uh, are extremely deliberate. There's um, homoerotic symbolism in this deck as well. This deck is considered to be uh, kind of like a malefic deck. A lot of people have speculated that it was used uh, for black magical purposes, that it was actually commissioned for black magic, um, that there is a family that commissioned an artist to create these cards and everything else. It's a whole history. And so they actually, in this deck, they don't have traditional titles for the cards, but they actually have specific names for, for the cards. And so this just happens to be the one that corresponds with the Emperor card. So Mario, Mario, Mars. Uh, that's the deal here. So I thought that was worth showing. And I said it earlier, but you flip the M, you get a W. Mars or Mar turns into war, right? And then if you play with those letters, you get an anagram for raw as well. And so to me, that makes a lot of sense with uh, the cardinal nature that relates to Aries. And I think a lot of people would agree that the energy of Mars, obviously very fiery, very passionate, lots and lots of energy, but it's kind of a raw energy, right? It's not necessarily refined, um, but it packs a punch, right? And so I think that's kind of interesting too. When you flip the M into a W, you get... Uh, some more words that kind of relate to the planet, in my opinion. War being one of them. So even the word Mar, though, by itself, uh, is very, very interesting. So in Spanish and uh, Latin, this means sea. And so isn't that kind of interesting? Why, why would this be the case? What's going on here with all of this? Um, I think there's a few reasons why Mar would be a reference to the sea, to the ocean, right, in these languages. And what I've kind of come to find out over time is that when you are decoding a particularly masculine energy or a particularly feminine energy, um, I see this in tarot all the time. And uh, for some of you guys who follow my work, uh, this might be just uh, old information, but when you are looking at an energetic quality that's, you know, overtly masculine or feminine, when you really, really start decoding things and when you really start unpacking the symbols that are associated with that archetypal energy, you are going to see the opposite gender um, within the signs and symbols associated with whatever it is you're looking into. And so as an example with the Emperor card, I showed this in my presentation about the Emperor card. When you go back and start looking at older emperor cards, you're gonna find a lot of feminine emperors, really effeminate emperors, where it's like they're trying to make um, the feminine quality um, be overt, and they're trying to show the emperor in that light. Um, I've noticed this you know, all over the place. So another good example in the tarot would be the card that corresponds with Leo is the strength card. And so you would think with the strength card and with it being a uh, correspondence with Leo that you would have this really powerful lion, right? Um, this really formidable, um, you know, king of the jungle. You would think that that card just represents the lion, you know, being aggressive, 
being powerful, all of that. But what do you actually see in that card? You're going to see a lion whimpering, kind of, with its uh, tail between its legs. And you're going to see a woman dominating the lion. You're going to see an expression of Virgo taming that beast. And so this is just another example of Leo is obviously uh, ruled by the sun, the sun, S-U-N or S-O-N. And so there's that male energy, but yet the card that represents it has this very strong feminine quality to it. And she is uh, a much larger presence than the lion itself, actually. So when you start getting into masculine uh, symbolism, you're going to find the feminine. And when you get into feminine symbolism, you're going to find the masculine. And so it's just... It's this interesting dynamic that I've just noticed over the years. And so it's no different with Mars and it's no different with the emperor. And so the fact that Mar uh, means sea or ocean in some languages to me is fascinating and speaks to that, right? Also, so mare um, is like an old English word for a female horse, right? Um, it's also... Um, I believe it's an old English word. Uh, it's a reference to a succubus too. So this is where we get night mare from, right? And so to me, again, it's a, f a female horse um, speaking to kind of what I've been talking about. And I believe the next word here, oh, also too, this is interesting, but a mare has been referred to as the dark spots on the moon where there was once an ocean. And so the spots on the moon that are... Um, you know, they look like kind of like large craters or valleys or something like that. Um, the belief, what we're told, right? Which I think all of this stuff is up for debate and it's good to be skeptical over all of these things. But um, the darker spots on the moon were once believed, uh, so we're told, to contain oceans, but now they're dry and now they're barren. Um, I was just on a podcast yesterday and um, one of the guests brought up this word, barren. Um, shout out to uh, Seven Degrees of Wisdom. And she was mentioning uh, the word barren with the Emperor card. And uh, it just reminds me of even Mars, the planet itself, and how it's known for being kind of like a barren wasteland. And we'll be getting into some of that stuff later on in the presentation. But these dry areas on the moon are called mares, right? And so I think that's very, very interesting, especially given the fact that Mar already has a relationship with the ocean. The moon has a relationship with water, very watery planet, uh, corresponding with silver and things like that. Uh, very, very receptive, right? Um, the moon, to me, just kind of like exudes uh, this receptive sort of quality, receptivity. So it kind of pulls things in, right? Um, and so I thought that was worth sharing at least, right? So mare being these darker spots on the moon and you can, you know, look this up and you'll see maps, right? Where it shows you all of the mares, you know, on the moon. But what I thought the slide was going to be was this slide was Mary. So Mary, mother Mary, the Virgin Mary, right? There's that M-A-R in Mary's name. So, uh, Mario and Mary are related. It goes back to the red planet, right? And Mary, she is uh, an expression of Virgo. So she's an expression of the queen of heaven. And so I see her being very much in the lineage of Virgo and Isis and uh, things like that. She is uh, like a terrestrial expression of the queen of heaven, I would say. And so she is known for her virgin birth, right? The, the virgin birth of Christ. And, um, it's really interesting because Mars was also said to be born of a virgin, right? And so I think that there's an interesting sort of correspondence here with all of that stuff. Um, also, it's not uncommon to see Mary standing on top of a crescent moon. Um, so lunar symbolism has uh, been a thing that you can see within you know, statues and paintings and works of art that depict Mary. And here we have all this stuff relating to the sea, to the ocean, what have you. Um, she's also referred to as Stella Maris. Um, and so she is the star of the sea, Maris, right? And so 
to me, that is just a really, really intriguing thread that there is all of this watery symbolism that is associated also with Mars, right? I mean, we get maritime, you know, from Mars, from this watery association, at least. And so um, maritime relating to the ocean, right? Maritime law, things like that, uh, to be a marine, right? And so um, the M-A-R can be seen with a lot of watery symbols as well, and a lot of watery words. So all just food for thought, right? And I just figured it was all worth including. Kind of... Um, you know, going down this uh, wordplay sort of rabbit hole. But I've learned over time that a lot of the vowels can be, you know, um, substituted for other vowels. And when you do that, you unlock new connections. And so I don't usually go crazy with this in my own personal research, but I just had to include this one. So how different is mar and mer, right? We're going to look at a few words that uh, to me suggest that they're absolutely related to each other. And so with mer, you it reminds me of like mercury. You know, that was the first thing I thought of is mercury. And uh, I think this is appropriate because I find a lot of mercurial symbolism within the Mars and Emperor rabbit hole. But I say that about Mercury all the time. Mercury is such a shapeshifter that I see Mercury all over the place. And so um, his association with Mars and his association or their association with Mars and the Emperor, you have to dig a little bit deeper. But once it's pointed out to you, it becomes very, very obvious. And I honestly, I just feel like with basically every single sign, I see Mercury's presence in some way, shape, or form. And it's really, really obvious with, um, with certain signs for, um, you know, for known reasons because it corresponds with literally Mercury the planet or whatever. But I just tend to see it, you know, more often than not. So Mar and Mer, let's go down this a little bit and kind of explore. As I already said, Mercury, right, the messenger of the gods the psychopomp, the trickster. A lot of merchants, right? Um, they had a strong reverence for Mercury. And so Mercury has been like a, um, a deity for a lot of different things over time. But uh, merchant class people have long um, had this reverence for Mercury. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, mercurial symbolism definitely relates to money, the flow of money. Um, it has a lot to do with um, literally goods and services being traded back and forth. So there's a lot of movement with Mercury. Mercury, again, is a traveler. And so um, when you're doing business with people, it might require travel or a literal physical exchange of goods, shipping things here, shipping things there you know, all over the world sort of thing. So I think it's very fascinating that Mercury was a deity for the merchant class. And uh, there you have the Mer right there in front of merchant, right? Also, Mercury is, uh, you know, related to this idea of the divine androgyne. So being both masculine and feminine, right? And so um, I think of words like mermaid as an example, half woman, half fish or half human half fish and so there are other examples like this where the um you know the root mer absolutely relates to mercury and so the fact that mer and mar are so closely related i just think is an interesting sort of thing the other thing i'll say too is that it's kind of um you know it's been said many many times over the years but men are from mars right women are from venus and so I think you can make the case that men are actually from Mercury and women are from Venus. And so um, even just looking at the glyphs, right? So the glyph for Venus, as an example, all you have to do is add the horns and then you get the glyph for Mercury. So um, I have at least one resource 
in my little library over here that suggests that the true consort of Venus is actually Mercury and not Mars, which I think is very, very interesting. Also, I'll just say that Mercury is heavily related to the phallus, to phallic symbolism, which I've talked about in other streams and videos. And so when you're dealing with Mars, there's a lot of phallic energy kind of going on there. So arguably even the arrow coming out from the circle in the Mars glyph, you know, is, uh, is very phallic, right? And so there's all of those connections. And uh, if you're a merchant and you're in business, you might, you know, uh, set up shop at a market. So there are things having to do with business and trade like market that's also start with MAR, but also have this interesting correspondence in my opinion, with mercurial symbolism. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And you even have that mark, right? This target sort of idea, market. Um, and so obviously when you're doing business as well, you're competing with other merchants, you're dealing with other businesses, you're competing with other businesses. And so um, there's a lot to be said regarding um, the free trade market, capitalism, all of that, and um, competition, right? And so I'm starting to kind of acknowledge Mars um, in a light that basically, you know, um, I see a lot of the beautiful things about Mars and I'm seeing the shadow aspect of Mars. But um, when I think of competition and it doesn't have to be physical competition, it doesn't have to be outright war or aggression, but just competition in general is a very Martian sort of thing, right? And here in market, you literally have MAR. All right, so um, so those are the main words that I wanted to cover. And guys, there are so many more words anybody can get into, you know, and start decoding and, and breaking down and all of that. But those are some of the key ones that I wanted to discuss for today. Um, and you guys probably, I would imagine, I'm not checking the chat, but uh, you guys are probably throwing out other words and things like that. And, um, you know, just throwing more into the mix. And so please, by all means, I want to read them. So uh, leave a comment in the chat or leave a comment down below. But for a little, uh, little bit of a detour here, I want to talk about Mars and pop culture. Because there are a lot of examples of Mars in popular uh, movies and within uh, pop culture and, uh, you know, media and things like that. The first one that came to my mind was Total Recall, right? So um, Mars plays a big role in Total Recall. So there you see a couple of figures on the right-hand side. And uh, I actually have not seen Total Recall in a really, really long time. Um, and so I can't remember all of the details. But my understanding, right, is that they're on uh, the Red Planet, and it's the future. And... Um, you know, it's kind of like a debaucherous sort of place, right? Um, and since it's futuristic, it's very weird. It's very odd. Uh, it's science fiction, right? So they uh, are doing a lot of sci-fi, you know, sort of things that you'll see in other, um, in other films. But uh, Total Recall takes place on Mars. There's so many different, or a portion of it at least, takes place on Mars. There's so many different examples of Mars, uh, you know, in pop culture, um, from Total Recall and to more recently, you know, the Martian Mars attacks, <laughs> right? And so there's always been this idea that um, there are ETs that are going to come from outer space and they're going to take over Earth and they're going to kill all of the humans. This is like a, a classic sort of trope or theme in, um, in science fiction. And so I believe the next one I have here, right, is The War of the Worlds by... H.G. Uh, Wells, um, that whole saga, and uh, these alien forces, they came from Mars. And so I think it's really interesting. The reason why I wanted to bring some of this up is because um, Mars it has been viewed in a few different lights from what I gather. One of the things is that there's this idea that Mars is going to be, well, it, it's kind of related to this homeland sort of concept. And so there is a belief that Mars was once our homeland and got destroyed and we came to Earth. 
or that Mars will become our homeland. And uh, I believe, right, that's what the Martian gets into. And so um, this idea that we can go and terraform Mars and that we can turn it around and we can turn it into a new Earth sort of idea. And that um, we are, you know, the idea is that we are destroying Earth and so we will need to have, you know, another plan that humanity will need uh, another place to go. Um, and Mars has long been viewed as that planet. And so to me, that's just very interesting. I think it has to do with the proximity of Mars to Earth, right? And um, I think that, you know, obviously this is just going to continue on, continue forward. So it's been like this for a while. Um, I had a friend that used to go on and on and on about some of this stuff about how um, we're going to be all Martians one day and that we're going to live on Mars. And this narrative continues to this very day, obviously. Um, and so you hear more about this, I would say, with Mars than you do with the moon. The moon is like, we'll, we'll build a base on the moon or we'll visit the moon or something like that. But Mars um, tends to be more so related to this idea of, no, this is actually going to be our new homeland sort of thing. So just to kind of you know, completely wrap our head around Mars symbolism as it's portrayed in uh, popular media. I felt like this was absolutely worth bringing up. And um, yeah, it's really funny too. I mean, I can't see this poster and not think about how I walked out of Mars Attacks when I was a kid <laughs> and it was out in theaters. I did not understand it. I didn't get it. The humor was probably way over my head. I know there's like people who are fans of this movie. Um, I personally was not, and I have not seen it since, so I can't really say uh, if it's worth watching or not. You've got Marvin the Martian, right? And so he's wearing that helmet. He looks like a Roman soldier. Um, and then he has his little space pistol there. So he is fit for battle, and that is his deal, right? So this is a little Martian character. And then even, too... This reminds me of uh, some of the word stuff, right? So Martian, and then even within that you have Mart. So there's another word, right? Like Walmart, right? Uh, Mart being related to market and being a place uh, where you can buy and sell things. And so um, very, very interesting, the fact that Martian has Mart in it. And I was talking about some of that stuff uh, just a few minutes ago. I think it's kind of, you know, arguable that, um, and I don't really know the lore surrounding Iron Man, and I'm not so much a Marvel person, but uh, Iron corresponds with Mars. And so this is an interesting thread that could be unpacked um, a great deal. And there's a few things that I'll be saying later on regarding Iron, um, but Iron Man, isn't that interesting? He is you know, always in that um, red golden outfit. And um, he is a formidable warrior himself. And so um, he is symbolic of aggression and he's symbolic of um, competition as well, Tony Stark is. And so of all the medals, right, obviously iron, I, I think is very, very appropriate. Um, and so when I see Iron Man, I can't not think of Mars and I can't think of, I can't not think of Martian sort of themes and things like that. Um, but again, I'm not the right person to uh, completely decode, you know, Iron Man sort of lore or anything like that. But I do think there's something to be said about that. And I'm sure, you know, the creators of Iron Man um, were at the very least aware of the Mars correspondence with Iron. Also, I'll just say, iron revolutionized uh, modern war and modern warfare. And so um, iron's history is interesting. And um, without it, you know, there are just a lot of tools and weapons and things like that that would not have been created. And so when it comes to war, um, you know, iron um, has its place for sure in um when you're looking into you know the history of war and things like that <laughs> so i already mentioned it but 
Mario, right, being related to Mars. Isn't it interesting that Mario is well known for wearing red? And so, and he, you know, from the early days, he's always, you know, throwing fireballs and things like that. So he's always moving right across the screen. He's always jumping. Um, man, actually, I really need to do my own Mario Brothers decode because for years I have thought about some of the esoteric implications <laughs> of Mario and Luigi and uh, all of the things that they do in their games. And uh, there is a lot to unpack. And I think you guys would totally dig it. I, you know, probably a couple years ago now, I wrote down a bunch of notes um, regarding Mario Brothers and some of the symbolism that I saw. As an example, I think Mario and Luigi, I think they're just another newer modern expression of the Gemini twins, right? I was kind of talking about Gemini and twin symbolism earlier. But Mario being named Mario and wearing red, I think is a really, really good fit. So I would say even by extension, I can see the Mars symbolism uh, within Mario. And he's always saving the princess, right? Um, she's always getting herself into trouble or getting kidnapped or something. And so he has to travel and go to all these different worlds, going to the heavens, to the underworld, things like that. And um, yeah, so I think that uh, there's, there's the case to be made that uh, Mars symbolism has been baked into some of the lore associated with Mario, given his namesake and then also given, you know, what he traditionally wears. Right, so this is a really interesting section <laughs> of the presentation. And I have my girlfriend, Michelle, to thank for kind of prompting this one, actually, because she brought it to my attention and she wondered if this was a valid sort of connection. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, uh, yes, it is. In fact, it's spot on and it's very, very interesting in my opinion. And this has to do with uh, menstruation. It has to do with blood. And so I think it's really interesting that Mars is associated with sacrifice as I kind of have been talking about, right? And I've been talking about sacrifice in other um, videos and, and podcasts and things like that. Just the necessary element of sacrifice and how um, sacrifice isn't necessarily a negative thing. Although I think a lot of people, that's gonna be their first sort of take on things, right? As an example, I'm sacrificing other things to be here right now, to talk into this microphone and give this presentation to you guys. You guys are sacrificing, perhaps doing other things by watching this video. You know, watching this video is a sacrifice. You guys could be doing any number of things, but you're choosing to be here right now listening to this video. And so, um, so the nature of sacrifice, the symbolism of sacrifice can take on many, many sort of um, different um, sort of perspectives, I guess you can say. And so there is a whole thread here, right, with Mars, with the Emperor card, with Aries season, um, that um, this sacrifice is for the common good. And that the sacrifice of, say, a savior, of a messiah, um, is what's necessary or needed for things to kind of move forward. So the whole entire thing with Passover, right, is the sacrifice of the firstborn son. And so um, the firstborn son or the first child, um, and actually, I'm not sure if first fruit is necessarily related to just the firstborn son or just the firstborn child, but there's this idea of a first fruit and the first fruit being uh, given to the state or to the empire or to the church, your first harvest being given, you know, um, to, you know, um, whatever, whatever sort of hierarchical structure you live within, right? And so there's this sort of thing that has been like uh, around for a very long time that your first child um, needs to be given up in order for balance to kind of be restored. And it's like, regardless of what you think about any of this stuff, uh, morally, ethically, um, this is a big part of mythology. It's a big part of um, some of the Abrahamic religions, right? There are whole storylines about all of this, sacrificing your first, 
you know, born son to Moloch or something like that. Right. And so um, a lot of that symbolism has to do with this time of year. Even Moloch, you know, it's a bull deity. So uh, it reminds me of Taurus. Um, the idea is that springtime, um, in order for spring to kind of bloom and blossom and thrive, um, something needed to be sacrificed. And so I think that that's what this correspondence ultimately is all about. And even if you just look at the seasons in general, you can't have spring without winter. You can't have winter without fall. You can't have fall without summer. You can't have any of these seasons without the other seasons. So in order to have, obviously it depends on where you live, but in order to have a nice summer with the sun out and everyone's outside and it's freaking fantastic and you're wearing tank tops and shorts or whatever and sandals, you needed to go through um, the winter. You needed to go through, you know, Capricorn season. Um, so these are all necessary sort of things. These are necessary um, cycles that everything goes through, right? And so speaking of cycles, uh, what about the cycle of menstruation? You know, the more I started thinking about it, the more I realized that um, a woman's period is a sacrifice. So women are born with all of the eggs that they're going to have throughout their lifetime. Men, on the other hand, create sperm, you know, routinely, regularly, all the time. Okay. So that's just the nature of things. And so one egg, usually, not all the time, obviously, but one egg is sacrificed every single month through this monthly cycle that uh, all women have. And so to me, the sacrificial nature of that is very obvious that this sacrifice and even to me, the discomfort, and this is obviously I'm a man talking from a man's perspective, but this discomfort um, seems to me like it's also a necessary part of, uh, of the cycle. I'm not wishing for you know anyone to have excruciating pain or anything else, but why is this sort of the thing? It's like if you're shedding blood um, and you're going through this cycle, you know, and you're you are in discomfort, um, it seems to me like nature doesn't really make mistakes, right? And I know obviously diet and um, you know the minerals that you might have in your body and um, all of the things you know uh, what drugs you might be on or, or not on, you know, can affect all of these different things. But to me, the monthly period is uh, symbolic of this exact same sort of sacrifice um, that I'm kind of speaking to regarding, um, you know, the nature of spring, nature of uh, airy season and whatnot. The other thing, though, that I want to mention, uh, which I think is really, really interesting, is the idea that, you know, we all have um, copper and iron. And I'm just going to pull those two and highlight those two. Um, I am not an expert on these things, but my understanding is that we all have copper and we all have blood. Um, sorry, we all have copper and we all have iron in our blood. Men have more iron in their blood than women. Women have more copper in their blood than men. Copper corresponds with Venus. So isn't that interesting that men are from Mars, as it's traditionally said, which Mars corresponds with iron and we have more iron in our blood um, and women correspond uh, with Venus and Venus corresponds with copper and they have more copper in their blood. To me, when I first found that out, my mind was blown. I thought that was really, really interesting. But the kicker here is uh, when I was talking to Michelle about all this stuff, I asked her, I'm like, isn't it right that um, iron deficiency or iron loss is like a common thing if you have a really heavy flow? And she said, yes, that iron supplements are a thing for some women and that they need to be aware of their iron intake during, um, during their cycle. And so, or for their cycle rather. And so iron loss during menstruation is a thing. And I'm just like, wow, here we have, I'm already putting some of these things together regarding the sacrificial nature of all of this. Um, and then this iron correspondence is related to it, which has a correspondence with Mars, which is a planet related to sacrifice and also related to sacrifice, by the way, is if you're going to pull 
one sign and talk about the nature of sacrifice, um, I would say that the sign that corresponds with this the most would be Scorpio. And under the traditional system, Scorpio corresponds with Mars. Mars is the ruling planet of Scorpio under the traditional seven planetary system, which is what I generally follow. Um, and so there's all of that stuff. Also, Scorpio too very much relates to um, like a darker divine feminine sort of energy. And that's a whole thing too. Uh, you know, I'm even debating in my mind if I should get into it because it's a whole rabbit hole. But just real quick, the glyph for Scorpio is an M with that little arrow at the end. The glyph for Virgo is also an M. And here we are talking about Mars, right? And I already pointed out the correspondence with Mars and Mary, Mari. And uh, Mari, Mary is the Virgo sort of correspondence uh, with the church. And so she has a direct relationship, obviously, with, uh, with Virgo, the sign. And I would say by extension too, really, uh, Virgo and Scorpio are just uh, kind of polarities of each other in so many ways. They balance each other out, which is why they're on opposite sides of Libra, the scales. So you have Virgo with an M glyph, right, with a fish, and then you have Libra, and then you have Scorpio. So what are the odds that the two glyphs in astrology that are the M's are on opposite sides of each other across uh, from one another with Libra being right there in the middle. I've also long heard too, just to kind of wrap this up, but that Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio were once a very large sign and that the insertion of Libra actually broke up um, this large constellation. And um, this is why too the... Um, the claws of Scorpio are sometimes depicted in the pans of Libra. And so um, they're, and I believe the pans of Libra sometimes are known as the Northern and Southern claws, if I'm not mistaken, or the Northern and Southern claws of Scorpio are related to the pans of Libra, as I just said. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, lastly, I'll say that we call it, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the whole you know, finding the masculine within the feminine, the feminine within the masculine thing. Um, we call it menstruation, right? M-E-N. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Of all the things, why does menstruation or menses uh, start with M-E-N? I think that's very, very interesting. It makes me wonder if it has to do with some of the stuff that I'm saying right now. So that's kind of what I wanted to point out uh, regarding all of that. Uh, hopefully that all made sense and uh, I'd love to know what you guys think about it. Also regarding iron and the blood, um, all of these symbols that you see right here, these were all once symbols for iron itself, the metal iron. Okay. So sometimes literally just the glyph of Mars indicated iron, sometimes it pointing straight up. Um, was the glyph for iron. And then sometimes it kind of looked like the glyph for Sagittarius with those two dots at the end. Which I would say that um, there's an interesting relationship with Mars, Aries, and Sagittarius. Um, Sagittarius being the last fire sign, right? Um, and then also both of their arrows, the Mars, the traditional Mars glyph, and then the uh, iron glyph on the right, um, both kind of pointing in the exact same direction. So again, these were all once symbols that indicated iron um, in alchemy, which I think is fascinating. And of course, they all have arrows. They all imply movement. And the most basic arrow, I think, too, is like the upward triangle or just a triangle in general, right? Because it's always pointing in some direction. And the upward triangle is the um, the symbol for fire, which obviously Mars is a fire planet. 
So let's get into the Mars glyph and see what's going on there. Um, I do think it's interesting that it's always pointing to the upper right. And um, to me, this just kind of speaks to an upward forward sort of movement, not unlike a ram climbing up the mountain. Um, and so one of the sort of uh, metaphors that I think is really interesting is that the ram is kind of like the draft animal that pulls the rest of the zodiac. So imagine the zodiac wheel kind of being like a chariot wheel or being a uh, literal, like a series of chariots or a large chariot or something along those lines. Um, that the animal that's pulling the chariot is the ram, you know, and the ram associates uh, very strongly with the head. And so there's always this headstrong sort of nature related to Aries and the ram. There's a lot of things that can be said about that as well. The ram's horns um, and, um, you know, just uh, the whole idea of us, humanity, coming into this reality head first. We crown first, right? So related to more head symbolism. And so it really goes on and on and on. But kind of, uh, I think that when I see the uh, the Mars glyph, I kind of think about some of this stuff. And then also, too, with the Aries glyph, it's obviously depicting the horns of a ram, but it also looks like a sprout. You know, so there's this upward sort of movement or momentum. And uh, you also get that with the glyph, as simple as it is. Also, I've been saying this lately, but when you break down really simple sigils or glyphs like this, um, one of the things to kind of acknowledge here is that there's basically two main components to this glyph. There's the actual circle itself, and then there's the arrow pointing to the upper right. Um, arguably, the arrow on the upper right is more phallic, it's more masculine, and then the circle is more feminine. So what you see here is the kind of phallic masculine energy coming out of the feminine, the feminine circle, right? And so, um, but the arrow is in a more prominent position, you know, um, if you're just looking at things from a top down perspective, if you're just kind of reading the sign um, top down, um, the arrow is in a more prominent position um, whereas the feminine aspect, the circular curvy aspect of the circle is in a lower position, but yet it seems as though this is kind of the genesis of, of the phallic energy sort of thing. So it just reminds me of masculine energy coming from the feminine. Um, so I think again of like the, uh, the whole myth of Sophia and the Demiurge or the queen of heaven giving birth to her male counterpart and that uh, masculine energy, I think in so many ways comes from the feminine, the divine feminine. Um, so kind of like the whole idea of this virgin birth thing as well, that um, there are numerous storylines. There's, there's a number of myths regarding uh, a uh, virgin birth sort of uh, story and it implies it's always too generally a male that is birthed or born from a virgin so the woman did not need a male counterpart did not need a partner did not necessarily even need the seed of man in order to create man so um so i kind of think about that here of just the nature of the interplay between the arrow and then the circle itself but there is this uh, at least hint that the masculine energy is taking precedence over the feminine energy. At least that's kind of what I see. So this is the glyph for Venus. So kind of like what I was just talking about. Notice now the feminine circle is above the cross down below. And I would say that the cross relates to um, more of a patriarchal sort of energy, which is why the cross relates to four. It relates to stability. Um, and which is why the emperor card is the fourth card of the major arcana. So you make a cross, you're creating four quadrants. You're alluding to the number four. When you're using the circle, you know, you're alluding to, I think, spirit. I think you're potentially alluding to chaos, uh, ether, things like that. The heavens, the spinning of heavens, 
right? So uh, the circle definitely corresponds more so with heavenly symbolism and the cross definitely corresponds more so with a uh, terrestrial sort of energy or a grounded sort of energy. And I would say uh, you can make the case of um, that it relates to a masculine sort of energy. Look at those, um, you know, there's 90 degree angles with that cross, right? So with the Venus glyph, you have the feminine over the masculine. That's how I break it down. That's how I tend to see it, which uh, I was really interested to learn. And I've brought this up before, but that there are some groups that actually used this glyph for the glyph of Mars. And so it's just an inverted Venus glyph, an inverted Venus symbol. And so you are putting the masculine, that cross above the feminine. And this is personally what I use in my notes. So the traditional symbol of Mars, the circle with the arrow, sometimes I do use that when I'm um, writing down notes and whatnot. Um, but I more often than not use this because I really like kind of how it creates a, there, there's an element to it that um, I, I just like the fact that um, it's relating Venus and Mars together. And I like the fact that we're kind of recycling a sigil or using a sigil in a new light. And I like the fact that it's just a simple inversion and how, as I've been kind of breaking down for the last however long, um, I like how you can kind of see the masculine energy within this glyph. And then conversely, you can see the feminine energy within this glyph. So um, I don't know, for a lot of different reasons, I kind of like it. I kind of like how it simplifies the system of glyphs for all of the, uh, for all of the planets. So if this is a masculine sort of symbol, um, you know, we're, can, have we seen this anywhere, basically? And uh, the fact of the matter is we have, we have seen it and we saw a lot of it during my uh, Emperor card presentation. So this is known as the Globus Cruciger, what he's holding in his right hand. You will see, obviously, it looks a lot like the glyph I just showed you, the upside down Venus symbol. And um, this is just one of the emperor cards that really emphasizes the Globus Cruciger, which has also been known as the Holy Hand Grenade. So how appropriate is this, right? That the card that corresponds with Aries, that is ruled by Mars, has uh, the figure holding an upside down Venus glyph, which is sometimes used as the glyph for Mars. I just think that all of this stuff is really fascinating and brilliant. Um, one thing I'll point out is just how large his staff is. That phallic energy is very present, right? But um, yeah, I just wanted to point out the Globus Cruciger. I talked about it on my uh, Emperor card stream if you wanna learn a little bit more about it. Um, there's even more things that I learned since that presentation about the Globus Cruciger that uh, I would like to talk about at some point. I don't know if today's the day, but I just wanted to show you guys um, that upside down Venus glyph slash Mars glyph that is the Globus Cruciger. And we'll see another example here in this presentation uh, in a few slides. But getting back to some of the wordplay stuff, um, Mardi, as in like Mardi Gras, right? Fat Tuesday. So there are um, several languages where the word that indicates Tuesday starts with M-A-R, like Marty here, or Martis. Um, and so to me, that's really interesting because Tuesday is the day of Mars. Monday is moon day, Tuesday is the day of Mars, Wednesday is Mercury, etc. cetera. And so, um, so you have Mars to thank for some of these words, right? Well, uh, something you guys maybe are already aware of, probably I'm sure a handful of you in the chat are aware of this connection between Tuesday and Mars and the fact that we get Tuesday from Tyr, or uh, I don't even know how to say the other version of it. I guess it would be two, T-I-W. Um, but the Norse god Tyr is very Martian. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of Mars qualities 
that correspond with Tyr. And there are several variations on how to spell his name. But long story short, this is where we get Tuesday from, the day of Mars. And the kicker to me is its glyph, the the uh, the the rune that corresponds with Tyr. Uh, but before I get there, I acknowledged martyrdom earlier and the word martyr, right? And how it ends with T-Y-R. Here you have that T-I-T-Y-R once again. And so just literally the T-Y-R is very, very Martian. And so... Um, I've been a fan of a fan. I've been um, studying the runes for like years now. I kind of go in and out with um, being really interested in uh, runic symbolism and uh, the different sort of meanings behind the runes and everything else. Um, but I just have to show you the rune that's associated with Tyr. And it's just a very simple upward pointing arrow, right? Very much related to Mars or at least the traditional glyph and some of the other things that I've been pointing out. Also too, you know, just using your imagination a little bit, it's not unlike a T a little bit, right? So Tuesday, the letter T. And so anyways, uh, this is the rune for Tyr. Thought that was worth incorporating into the conversation. And also, um, you know, I've been talking about the emperor card and this number four business Right. And so the number four being related to uh, Aries uh, season and also just the fact that um, most of Aries season takes place during the fourth month of the year as well, which I think is intriguing. Also, what I've been saying regarding the Venus glyph is that the cross is the masculine element or the masculine section of the glyph. And here, um, you know, the number four can be easily kind of, you know, um, observed within any kind of cross, basically, right? And so, um, and then again, the cross, Christ was crucified on a cross during airy season. He is the Lamb of God. Um, and so we'll be looking at a card here with some lamb symbolism and how that obviously clearly, you know, um, rams are lambs. And so... There's all of that. Um, and then also the uh, the glyph for Jupiter looking a lot like the number four. And Jupiter and Mars have a kind of long history with each other. Um, what I have been reading lately is that it's kind of not uncommon for Mars to be confused for Jupiter. And it's kind of not uncommon for Mars to kind of be used as another planet that has a lot of Jupiterian symbolism baked into it. And so isn't it interesting that the uh, emperor card is number four. I've been talking about the cross, the four sections, all that stuff. And then literally one of the other planets, the king of the planets, its glyph looks like a number four and actually has, you know, a cross sort of baked into it. So for symbolism, definitely related to Mars. And I would say in a few different ways as well. And uh, I know there's more to be said about all of this, but there you go. The simple cross. Um, I would say too, since we're, we're kind of here and we're talking about it. Um, the cross uh, is a, and Christianity too, arguably, I mean, there's something to be said about the cross and its relationship to death. So the cross, uh, you go to any graveyard, you're probably going to see a lot of crosses. Um, when people have a, uh, you know, a crucifixion sort of painting in their house, I mean, they're putting a, uh, they're, they're showing a, um, someone who's been crucified, someone who has been killed, literally nailed to a cross. Right. So the cross in and of itself, um, once again, there's a lot to be said regarding death and um, destruction and the cross. I think that there's, you know, equally as many beautiful things that can be said about the cross and also kind of shadowy things about the cross. And really, too, to me, this kind of just reminds me of the emperor card anyway. Um, the fact that 
a balanced emperor, a holistic emperor, um, is, you know, a patriarchal figure. And so a patriarchal figure in its best sort of light can bring stability. It can bring order to a situation. It brings order to the family unit. It can bring order to a community or an empire. Conversely, it can bring death and destruction and mayhem as well. You know, uh, the emperor could be tyrannical, right? And he can bring terrible things to his community, terrible things to his family, um, terrible things to his empire. And so just like, you know, all symbols, there's a light side and a dark side to it. And so to me, the cross, um, there's a lot to unpack <laughs> about both of those sides. Uh, but the death symbolism related to the cross is, uh, to me, very apparent. Also, there's a lot of stuff to say regarding the origin of the cross, where it comes from, um, its mercurial associations. Um, the cross and mercury are definitely related in a few different ways, I would say. And also, too, I'll say that um, I believe, like the traditional cross that you're going to see at a church, um, and I've brought this up in other live streams as well, but to me, I think the original cross, if you will, was just that vertical line. And that at some point, a horizontal line was brought to it. So as just a vertical line, you know, it corresponds with the world axis or the cosmic axis. Once you bring that horizontal line, there's kind of a different implication, I would say. And so in one of my books, I have, it's called uh, The Origins, I believe, of the Celtic Cross or the History of the Celtic Cross. The author literally, the very beginning uh, section of the book says, before the cross, there were standing stones, there were pillars, right? There were uh, obelisks, things like that. And so the simple standing stone, the simple pillar, that simple vertical line, to me predates the cross. And then at some point, that horizontal bar was, uh, was brought into um, the fold. And so that vertical line if that is the primitive cross, if you will, if that predates the cross, it's basically phallic symbolism, pretty much, which relates to Mars and all of these other things. Right, so this is the Fleur de Lis. And uh, this kind of gets into this idea that Mars was born of a virgin. Um, there are, and I believe I have it here, yep. So you see that the Fleur de Lis on this emperor card down below, you see two of them. One is in uh, the shadow on the right-hand side, and then there's another one that's in the light on the left-hand side. The Fleur de Lis has been a symbol that I've kind of been fascinated with for a little while now. And I would say that there's two main things that it makes me think of. One is the idea that there were there are a number of myths involving a flower that's given to a young maiden, given to a virgin, and that this flower was the catalyst for this woman to have a virgin birth. So this happened with Mary. There are storylines related to Virgo, where Virgo was given this flower. And it's not uncommon for this flower to be a lily. And so that's what Florida Lee means, is flower of the lily. And so this, to me seems to be where the Fleur de Lis actually literally comes from. And the second thing it makes me think of is the idea that it's related to North, to the North, to Northern symbolism. And so um, a lot of older compasses and compass roses, literally the arrow that denotes North, that points North is the Fleur de Lis. And so if you haven't seen it, you guys should check out my what is Northern symbolism video. Uh, on my channel, and it kind of gets into it a little bit. And so um, there have been, you know, kings and royal families that make use of the fleur de lis. Obviously, it's a French thing. Uh, but I think when you really just break down the basic symbolism, I think what you're seeing is the masculine coming from the feminine. And so I think that that central point there is more phallic in nature. And then also the two um, petals are the feminine aspect. And so I think within the glyph or within the simple sort of rendition of the Fleur de Lis, it's an expression of what I was talking about regarding virgin birth. And these lilies will have this sort of kind of design where um, 
I always forget the name, but uh, is it the pistol um, that comes out of the flower? It can be very phallic in nature. And then it has, you know, obviously the petals right around it. So it's almost like the phallus coming out of the feminine. So masculine coming out of the feminine. Um, in a lot of ways, kind of how I've been talking about it lately, I think the Fleur de Lis might just be like a Western version of the Shiva Lingam, if you know what that looks like from the Vedic world. I don't have a picture of it here, but to me, that's kind of what I see is the masculine coming out of the feminine, right? And so this kind of speaks to the idea that Mars was born of a virgin or that Christ, a solar symbol, uh, amongst other things, though. Um, that uh, the patriarchal energy comes from the feminine, right? And so I think it's fascinating that you have these two Fleur de Lis symbols down below on the floor for the emperor. You can also see that he's holding that Globus Cruciger in his left hand, and you see those rams up top, right? You see the uh, shield down below, and then you see the sacrificial lamb, which he is. He is a sacrificial lamb, I would say, that he... Uh, is an expression of this same sort of idea, pretty much. And so the Fleur de Lis, to me, is related to Mars, you know, um, and also Virgo. And uh, that's just what I kind of pick up about it. The Mars connection is kind of a newer sort of thing for me. But uh, I think that there are receipts to back that up, actually. And regarding the northern symbolism stuff and how... Um, this relates to Mars or the Emperor or Aries. Um, you know, the Emperor is also symbolically a ram, right? And so, uh, especially in the Rider Waite version of the card, the Emperor looks like he's a central mountain. And so there's two mountains beside him, and then he is the central mountain, kind of uh, alluding to the, this stability sort of thing. And um, also, to me, relating himself to a world mountain or a central mountain. And so when you're dealing with the world mountain or central mountain, like Mount Maru, you're basically saying that this world mountain is like, um, is the world axis basically. And so there's other videos that I have that get way more into what the world axis represents and all of that. But one of the main things is that the idea behind the world axis or the cosmic axis, cause it's the same thing is that, it's, um, it's the axis in which everything revolves around. And so it brings stability, it brings structure, it brings order. And also because a lot of times it's just represented by a pole or a staff or a tree, a standing stone, an obelisk, it goes on and on and on, but it's very much associated with uh, phallic symbolism, phallic energy, right? And so when he's holding that scepter, um, that's what it's alluding to when that, you know, uh, lamb, the sacrificial lamb, he's holding that flag. That to me is what, you know, a lot of phallic post like pole, like symbols basically allude to. And it's just my understanding that, um, where the world axis is that there is both a masculine sort of element going on there. There's also a feminine element. So where there's a pole, you're probably going to find a hole. And, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about is the fact that a lot of symbolism breaks down to poles and holes. So, you know, at the north, there is something phallic going on symbolically. This has always been alluded to, but there's also something receptive going on as well. That's receiving that phallus, that's receiving that pole. So there is pole symbolism related to the north um, and to the sacred center. And there's whole symbolism related to the North and the sacred center. So in a way with the Fleur de Lis, it's kind of poles and holes. So you have the feminine, the feminine receptive nature uh, of the Fleur de Lis, but then you also have the phallic sort of nature of the Fleur de Lis as well. So that's what the Shiva Lingam also represents is that there's a phallus, but there's also a Yoni to it. And so I think that's kind of what you're seeing here is a, uh, a Yoni and a phallus essentially. So uh, let me see, is there anything else here about this card that I wanted to pull out and talk about? Uh, I think we're actually pretty good, but just notice that again, the four, um, it's kind of being alluded to with his crossed legs, that this is a cross and um, Crowley literally, cause this is from the thought deck. He literally said that 
they were trying to um, evoke the glyph for sulfur, which is a triangle above and then a cross right below it. Not unlike the Venus symbol, but instead of a circle, it's a, it's a triangle. And so here you can kind of see that he looks triangular up top, and then he's making that cross down below, once again relating to the four. And uh, this is the fourth card, right, of the Major Arcana. So when it comes to Mars, and thinking about that arrow, and thinking about everything Mars represents, there is this projective sort of quality to it. It's not receptive. It's always moving forward. Um, it you know relates to war and implementations of war, the bullet, the spear, the arrow, the battering ram, right? That rams through um, gates. You can storm the gates with a battering ram. Um, and so there is this projective sort of nature with Mars. There's kind of an ascension sort of quality to Mars as well. And when I think about this, not unlike with the Florida Lee, I think of the uh, I think of the Taurus field, and I think of how the Taurus field. This is just a very simple cross section of a Taurus field, but if you know how the Taurus field works, it's really fascinating. Essentially, it projects and receives, but it's the same system. There's an inner and an outer, but it's the same system. And so I, when I look at the Taurus field, I mean, I oftentimes I see the glyph for Aries. And uh, the headstrong sort of nature of Aries and the uh, perpetual forward movement of Aries and of Mars, right? And so I don't think that this is a mistake. I think that the Aries glyph um, also speaks to the Taurus field because the Taurus field, really, it's just one of the patterns that a lot of things in the natural world are based off of, one of the things, right? And so here you can see, imagine this Taurus field energy coming up and then coming back around and returning to itself. That's the thing. The whole, the central point of the Taurus field is um, projective and receptive. It's a white hole and a black hole. And so uh, sometimes it's been referred to as red shift and blue shift, right? But that energy is emitted, but it circles around and returns right back to itself. And if you were to look at the Taurus field in more of a 3D sort of context, it looks like a donut, right? So both with Aries and with Mars, I think of the projective quality. The same way it's, you know, Aries is the beginning of the astrological year. There's this projective quality, but what happens? It's always going to return back to self. You know, and I would say that Pisces represents that receptive quality. It's the end of the cycle. Aries is the beginning of the cycle. It's the firstborn. It begins things, but then it also returns to itself. And honestly, I think at some point I'm going to make a video talking about the major arcana and how the major arcana is just an expression of the Taurus field and how um, it's all about what's been referred to as a run and return of energy. And that it seems as though that's kind of what our souls do too. It's a run and return. So there's always a projective nature to it. We're always going somewhere. This is the nature of every single storyline. This is the path of the fool, but there's also a return as well. So it's, it's, it's a run and return. This is the nature of all cycles, beginning, going through the whole entire cycle, and then also returning back to where you started, not unlike the major arcana, right? You start with the fool, the path of the fool. He's unaware of the journey ahead. He moves forward. He is, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, he just, he hasn't gone through um, the different levels of initiation yet. And so he's kind of naive, right? But he goes through the whole entire cycle, right? And then at the very end, you get to the universe card or the world card. So you go from this sort of uh, individualistic, kind of naive perspective, um, very malleable, very raw, very new, and then you end up at literally the universe, which is speaking to everything in existence. And there's a harmonious quality to the universe card that you just don't see, or the world card that you don't see in the full card. And so it's this run, and then ultimately this return. And so it's the beginning, and then it's also the end of the cycle. And then we all know that the 
the nature of the major arcana is that it always returns back to the fool. So that's kind of what I see with the Aries glyph. And I think that Mars symbolically represents this projective sort of quality that ultimately returns back to itself. And I'm just going to show you that Fleur de Lis one last time. So does that not look like kind of a Taurus field with that energy, that phallic masculine energy coming from that central point? But as with all things, like I'm saying, it's going to return back to itself. And in a way, too, this just reminds me of the glyph for uh, the heart, which you can imagine that if this was drawn a little differently, you could see the heart-like nature of the Aries glyph. And so what it represents to me is the monad, the one splitting off and then uh, into two, two lines and then returning back to itself. So it's basically symbolically representing separation and unification. That's what the Taurus field represents as well. The unification in the middle, that energy separates, but returns back to itself. And yet the whole system, even though there's an inner and an outer, um, it's, it's holistic, it's a complete system. And so those are some thoughts that I felt like I needed to get off my chest uh, regarding Aries, Mars, the Taurus field. And then also too, guys, I mean, it's just amazing to me. The next sign is literally Taurus. That's also not a mistake. The fact that it's called a Taurus field and we refer to it as such, the bull of heaven, right? And so we're gonna unpack the Taurus field, I'm sure, uh, probably within the next few weeks because it's just such a important and, uh, symbol you know, to wrap your head around. And its relationship with Taurus, the next sign is very, very interesting. Also, this is just reminding me too, kind of interesting, Aries corresponds with Mars, Taurus corresponds with Venus. So they're right next to each other. Um, very, very intriguing. And then also under the traditional system, Libra corresponds with Venus and then Scorpio corresponds with Mars. So they're right next to each other, whether you're looking at the Libra Scorpio connection or the Aries Taurus connection. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the ram. For reasons that will be obvious to you in just a moment. And I like my liquids, guys. I usually have at least three liquids around. And so I feel like I always need a variety of things to drink during these streams. And by the way, if you're still here and watching, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so the RAM. What I wanted to do was I wanted to look at the traditional signs that are ruled by Mars. And that is the RAM and that is Scorpio, the Scorpion. And so when you just look at the RAM, its most prominent feature its most iconic feature are those horns, right? So here you see two rams engaging in battle. And once again, rams is an anagram for Mars, right? And rams have a lot of testosterone. And the, uh, the impact that's created when two rams butt heads, absolutely incredible. You can literally, I've heard you can literally hear it for miles, depending on where you're at. And so... Um, Rams, um, you know, they're fighting for dominance and supremacy, right? And these horns are how they do it. And so the horns, uh, their horns are incredibly thick, but they have this just completely iconic curl to them, right? And so I was thinking about the curl of the ram's horns and ram horn symbolism too, I'm and horn symbolism, right? We have the word horny. Right. And so uh, horn symbolism, very phallic, very sexual. Um, a ram caught in a thicket is like a, a metaphor. It, it means several things, but there's a, a sexual connotation with that as well. So you guys can use your imagination about that one. Um, but um, the horns of a ram, right? There's so much that can be said about it. But the curl to me 
is just, you know, it's so striking. And, um, you know, Rams are like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe Ram hunting might be the most expensive hunt you can go on. And their horns and uh, having, you know, a ram, a stuffed ram or something like that. Highly, highly prized. You are not going to get, um, you know, like a ram skull for cheap. You're not going to hunt ram on the cheap. In fact, literally just getting the permits to hunt a ram at the potential of uh, nabbing yourself a ram. Very, very expensive. It's an elite sport. It's an expensive sport. It's for rich people. You know, uh, common, normal people do not get the opportunity to do this. Or if you do get the opportunity because you're part of uh, a lottery or a raffle or something, you are extremely lucky. And uh, I went down a whole ram hunting rabbit hole last year, and there was so much stuff that I learned about it. But it all reminded me of Mars symbolism. It all reminded me of, of Aries symbolism. I thought it was fascinating because, you know, you have to go to great lengths to be able to uh, hunt a ram. There's so few of them now that literally people will follow rams for like years and they go out with the intention of hunting a specific ram um and so it's a whole community and so they share intel i saw you know they have they name rams you know uh if you're like really really into it there are places uh in the world in the u.s where they know how many rams there are exactly and they know exactly the ones that are going to be hunted for and everything else and so you can spend an extreme amount of money like hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to hunt these things at, at, uh, and you know you may come up empty-handed so anyway highly prized lots of interesting things there but this horn is also very 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 highly prized and so that is like the thing that i think draws people in about um you know trying to trying to kill a ram is they want that trophy of those horns right a lot of people a lot of hunters like that is like their bucket list sort of hunt um is to to go ahead and do that but the uh the horn the curve of the horn i thought was really interesting when you're looking at it in contrast to the other sign that mars is associated with which is the scorpion and so which is scorpio right and look at that curl with the tail with the scorpion's tail and that stinger at the end i think it's very very interesting that the scorpion looks like it's ready to fight it always looks this way it looks like it's fit for battle it permanently wears armor right i was talking about arms earlier right and arm symbolism but it looks like it's permanently wearing armor so, and even at least with this particular scorpion, I mean, th does this not exude Martian energy, you know? Um, and so here with the tail of the scorpion, you have a very similar curve. You have a very similar curl. And so to me, the correspondence or the thing that I just wanted to point out is, isn't it interesting that the ram has the curl in the horn and what are the horns used? It's it's used to fight, and then you have the curl of the uh, of the tail of the scorpion. And what is it used for? It's used to fight. Uh, also, too, in case you weren't aware, um, scorpions can can commit suicide, and so they can actually sting themselves to death. So that stinger can be used against self. And um, the thing I've always heard is that, and I I have this in several of my resources but that um, scorpions do not like to get cornered. And so if they get cornered or if they feel like um, it's, a, it's a no win situation, they will take themselves out. And so there are videos about this showing this uh, online. And I've actually, I put one of them in one of my uh, Scorpio videos a couple years ago. And so anyway, so this stinger can be used against enemies or against self obviously he also has those pinchers right but everything to me here exudes martian energy to the extreme but i just wanted to more than anything point out this curl and i know obviously the tail can unfurl but you know when it's in a fighting position that curl or that curve is absolutely present and it looks to me very similar to the curls of of those horns there 
And so how interesting is that, that, they're, that they both correspond with the planet of war, the red planet, Mars. Um, and so this curl, at least in this context, you know, it's used for defense. It's used to uh, fight. It's, uh, you know, obviously it's how they protect themselves, um, which I think is kind of beautiful too, because generally when we talk about spirals or curves or whatever, we tend to think of, you know, the spirals of life, right? But here they are being used for defense purposes, which is interesting. Um, but the the spiral of life can be seen all over the place. You know, it makes me think of the uh, golden ratio, the golden spiral. You can see it in seashells, right? You can see it in various plants, right? That have this spiral like nature to them. These are just a couple of really quick examples, right? Um, you could also see it with, um, you know, galaxies and things like that. And again, there's many, many other examples of this spiral, you know, um, the spiral of life, the curves of life. Um, and all of them have this sacred center sort of, you know, component with it. And so, um, so when I see the Scorpio, the scorpion, and I see Aries, the Ram, um, that's one of the things that kind of comes to mind. And uh, to me, that's just kind of a beautiful thing. And that's what I wanted to end this presentation on is the uh, the curls or the curl of the horns of the ram and then also of that tail right there. So that is what I have for you guys. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out and uh, watching this presentation. So I have a few um, things that I wanted to mention here at the very end. Um, first off, Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. And uh, these are actually my patrons. So shout out to everyone here. Uh, Amy, Troy, Amanda, Chance, Abby, Nicholas, uh, Yaakov, Monica, Nomad, Sarah, Julia, LS, Judy, Barbara, Adrian, Crystal, Christina, Eloise, Mia, Kurt, and Lockstep. Uh, much appreciated. Some of these people have been my patrons for a while, actually. And uh, their continued support honestly amazes me and is just so much appreciated that uh, I figured it was time that I start shouting out uh, the, my patrons basically on a more regular basis. And it's really cool too, because I'm just looking at this list here and um, you know, several of these people have podcasts that I've been on. Um, you know, maybe that's something that I'll do down the road is um, kind of shout out patrons and um, talk about you know, what projects they have going on. Um, but suffice it to say, big, big, uh, big thank you <laughs> to all of you guys. So uh, much love, much respect. Um, and if you want to become a patron, you can do so at patreon.com slash symbolic studies. Um, I would be very, very grateful for your patronage. And, uh, you know, really, you become a sponsor of uh, my channel and you're sponsoring the arts. So I got into a conversation the other day and someone asked me if I, um, you know, do I consider myself a researcher or a scholar? And honestly, guys, I really look at myself more so like an artist. And so um, so that's kind of what I see Patreon doing is, is being um, giving you a place to get sponsors to sponsor your art. And so this presentation here, I look at it more as a work of art personally. I'm doing research, obviously, um, and I like talking about these connections, but you know, I'm just like a lifelong artist, basically. And so to me, this feels more like an art project more than anything else, um, including all of the stuff that I'm looking into and, and all of that. So if you wanna support an artist like myself, uh, you can do so at patreon.com slash symbolic studies. I have three tiers um, for, uh, you know, whatever your budget might be. Um, it all goes a long way. So there's all of that. All patrons receive my elemental study packet. And so I have this elemental study packet. And right now there are four sheets, one for water, fire, air, and earth. And every new patron, I literally just send a direct message to on Patreon and I send them a link to download the study packet. And there's lots of cool correspondences. Um, some of these correspondences, by the way, just saying I have not seen anywhere else. So there is original research, original kind of uh, information 
on some of these pages. Um, but if you want to familiarize yourself more with the elements, um, including the element of fire, this is a great way to do that. So I will send you um, a link to download that if you become a patron. Conversely, if you don't want to become a patron, you can literally send me a donation and I have information on that um, on my website. And um, anyone who sends a donation of any amount receives a study packet. And so um, anyways, so there is all of that. Also, Symbolic Studios is a thing. Um, I've been a graphic designer for 20 years and I have done everything under the sun, honestly, with design. So billboards, packaging, logos, websites, social media, you name it. That is what I do. That's my bread and butter. And so if you are in need of graphic design services, if you want somebody to design, you know, your logo as an example, or your uh, packaging, but you want them to be symbolically literate, um, I'm definitely your guy. And so design work actually got me interested in symbolism. So I don't think I would be here talking about all of this esoteric stuff if it weren't for graphic design. And so I just became really interested in some of the symbols that I was working with on a regular basis. And so one thing led to another over the years and kind of here I am. And so you get a little flavor of my design work, you know, in these presentations, but the work I do for clients is kind of a different ball game, if I'm being honest. And I'll show you a, a recent logo that I did for a client right after this. But here I have logo sigils, digital and print. So again, I love doing logos for people. I'm working on two or three logos for people right now. And um, I'm really stoked to do it. Logos are some of my favorite things to design. I've done sigils for people. So people have hit me up over the last couple of years through symbolic studies and are like, hey, I have a sigil that I want to design. Um, I want it to mean this. I want it to mean that. I'm using it for this purpose. Are you interested? And I've said yes. And I really like that process. I like the fact that people want to create these glyphs that are maybe being used for um, you know, magical spiritual purposes. So, you know, um, the person, one of the people that I'm thinking of, they had a few different ideas and I helped them refine the idea. I created a bunch of different sigils for them. And then we kind of just worked through that whole process together and they got exactly what they wanted. Um, I have digital here because I do a lot of digital design for people and for businesses, but I also do a lot of print work for people as well. So I've done, I've done both, um, quite a bit. So hit me up. You can, um, you know, you can find my contact information down below. This is uh, a logo that I designed last year for Rose Dragon Healing Arts. And so they had a very specific request to use a very specific type of dragon. And uh, we designed it together. And I think it came out really nicely. And so this is just one logo of dozens and dozens and dozens that I've made over time. So I think at the end of these presentations, while I'm plugging Symbolic Studios, I'm just going to include some design work just to show you some of the things that I've done, you know, uh, over the years. So the rose and the dragon were key components to this design because of the name. And uh, I like the way it came out. I think it's cool. Also, I'm available for tarot readings and study sessions. So tarot readings, um, I have a very organic sort of style. And I really like just meeting people who are, you know, followers and subscribers and things like that. So if you're interested, hit me up. Um, also, I do study sessions for people. So I've had people request all sorts of different things over the last couple of years. Um, some people have wanted me to review their artwork or poetry. Um, I've done dream analysis. So you can see with symbolism, there's so many different applications. So if you think that, um, I don't know, if you think there's something to gain from having a conversation with me, if you want one-on-one -on -one time to talk about any number of things, if you want to learn even more about Mars or Aries or whatever, um, feel free and reach out. You can text me at 503-893-4606. Or again, my contact information is down below. Here is my address for snail mail. Should you uh, be inclined to send me a letter or anything physical, 
P.O. Box 930, Carson, Washington, 98610. Also, I just have to say, my girlfriend has a channel, and it's awesome, and she interviews a lot of interesting people. She did a great interview earlier today. She goes live on Tuesdays, and uh, her, um, her podcast is called The Healing Home. And so if you want to find that on YouTube, it's Michelle's Healing Home. And um, when you support her, you're supporting me. When you support me, you support her. And so um, that's just kind of how it is. We also have a podcast together called Last Thursday. So every Thursday we go live at 6 p.m. Pacific. And she chooses a topic that she wants to talk about. I choose a topic I want to talk about. We talk about it. We usually drink something. Um, you know, we treat ourselves to uh, something to drink every single Thursday. It, we're uh, very interactive with the chat. And so that's always cool too. I love interacting with the chat. So it's a little bit different of a thing than what you're kind of seeing here. Um, but it's way more casual and um, it's been a lot of fun. So anyways, if that sounds interesting to you, you can check out her channel and you can, um, you know, watch one of our streams together every Thursday, last Thursday live. And then finally here, um, my website, <laughs> symbolicstudies.com. So if you're interested in any of the things that I just mentioned, symbolicstudies.com, uh, you can find, um, you know, my other accounts that I have online. You can find all sorts of things there. My Etsy channel, I never plug that really, or my ex Etsy account, excuse me, but I have uh, prints available, you know, things like that. So uh, for all of your symbolic studies needs, <laughs> symbolicstudies.com. And guys, that is going to do it. I am going to check the chat and see what's good for a few moments. But uh, once again, I appreciate you. Let me see what's going on here. Awesome. First comment I'm seeing is from King of Cups. What's up, dude? Um, so Chris is awesome. We just did a show about HP Lovecraft. And so uh, Chris is like a film guy. And um, he, uh, he wanted to talk about the Lovecraftian influence on modern cinema. So we just did that show together. He's fantastic. Um, hey there, Jenny G. Nice to see you. I'm seeing familiar faces as usual. You guys uh, are appreciated. I see Josh with a branch in here. What's up, dude? Um, nice to see ya. Cool. Uh, Artist Seer is here. Hello, Mari. Um, I think we'll be seeing you pretty soon, actually. So that's really cool. And it looks like you guys are, um, you know, getting along nicely in the chat. That's always good to see. And yeah, so Josh with the branch, he just says here, recently recorded an episode of Symbolic Studies with Mario a couple weeks ago. It was on plants in the Bible. You may enjoy it. Yeah, Joshua, uh, man, I really love his perspective. And we had a fantastic conversation. Actually, he was literally on Michelle's channel. And then he was on my channel uh, in the same week. And so um, check that out if you're interested. What's up, Alan? of alanmarcus.com. It's a real website, believe it or not. Uh, nice to see you, dude. Appreciate the support as always. Um, Didi, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Very cool. Uh, Liam Anderson, hello, hello. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ethereists Unite, nice to see you. Oh, cool, Kyle's here. What's up, man? Um, Kyle from Tippy Canoe Herbs. He's awesome, and uh, I really uh, value his perspective. And um, we do a monthly show together on the Interverse podcast called Astro Herbalism, and um, it's a good time. And I just, yeah, I like the guy quite a bit. And we are working together on a logo as well. And so, anyways, it's always great to see him in the chat. Of course, uh, Cody Torres, what's going on? Uh, yes, Balderson is here. Benjamin Balderson. What's up, dude? Uh, Scorpios don't like being cornered. Yeah, no, not so much. Uh, Balderson here is awesome. Uh, he has a show called Odin's Alchemy. I highly suggest it. I've been on it before. We talked about Northern symbolism. Solid, solid guy. Um, yeah, so always appreciate him. PK, what's going on, dude? Nice to see ya. Um, cool. So Elsie King too, um, great supporter of the channel. And we've done some shows together on my channel and elsewhere. Um, 
Yeah, awesome stuff. There are some very symbolically literate people here. <laughs> and I say it all the time, but there's some brilliant people here uh, as well. So I feel just blessed, seriously, that some of you guys would come and, and hang out and uh, hear my thoughts <laughs> regarding Mars symbolism. My Cherie, nice to see you. Cool, cool. Awesome, guys. All right, that's going to do it. Much love. Um, until next time. All right, take care. Have a good week.